Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Carl Racine, and I'm the Attorney General of the District of Columbia. Attorney General Brian Frost and I are here today to announce that earlier this morning, the State of Maryland and the District of Columbia filed a lawsuit in federal court against the President of the United States. The suit alleges that President Trump is flagrantly violating the Constitution which explicitly bars presidents from receiving gifts or inducements from foreign or domestic government entities. Never in the history of this country have we had a president with these kinds of extensive business entanglements, or a president who refused to adequately distance themselves from their holdings. President Trump's businesses and his dealings violate the Constitution's anti-corruption provisions, known as the emoluments clauses. The framers included these two anti-corruption provisions to prevent foreign and domestic entities from seeking to influence the president by bestowing money or other things of value on him. Why did the framers include these clauses? It was all about corruption. As Alexander Hamilton wrote, one of the weak sides of republics among their numerous advantages is that they afford too easy an inlet to foreign corruption. The framers knew that government entities, foreign and domestic, would of course try to use things of value to influence or induce the president to do their bidding instead of that of the American people. And now we see it every day. My office window is just a few floors above where we're sitting today. And I can tell you that as I look out the window and see the tower of the Trump International Hotel, we know exactly what's going on every single day. We know that foreign governments are spending money there in order to curry favor with the President of the United States. Just one example, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, whose government has important business and policy before the President of the United States, has already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars at the Trump International Hotel. And that hotel is but one example of how President Trump's vast global businesses and that empire he has is entangled with foreign and state government interests. We are a nation of laws, and no one, including the President of the United States, is above the law. No one, not even the President, can be allowed to endanger our democracy and erode our faith in our institutions. But just as at the time they're needed the most, traditional checks and balances are failing us. First, by not divesting from his businesses, the President has chosen to put himself and our country in the situation we find ourselves today. And every time the President has spoken about drawing a line between his presidency and his businesses, he's walked his promises back. Second, the Republican-controlled Congress has wholly failed to fulfill its responsibility of serving as a check and balance on the President, and has thus far given a president a total pass on his business entanglements. State attorney generals answer to the people of their jurisdictions, and we have a duty to enforce the law, and that's why we're taking action today. Like the unfairly maligned press corps and the courts, state attorney generals are serving as a necessary check and balance in the Trump era where others fail. We are the officials who brought the lawsuits that stopped President Trump's unconstitutional and un-American Muslim travel ban. We also call on the Department of Justice to appoint a special prosecutor in the Russia investigation. Today, we continue that tradition. Attorney General Frosch will now speak a bit more about why the Emoluments Clause are so vital to the health of our democracy. Brian? First, uh, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, it has been a great collaboration with you and your team. We appreciate it very much. Thanks also to my staff and to Norm Eisen and, and his team. 
This case is about the right of hundreds of millions of Americans to honest government. Uh, elected leaders who serve the people and not their own financial interests are the indispensable foundation of our democracy. And the president, above all other elected officials, must have only the interests of Americans at the heart of every decision. Our constituents must know that a president who orders their sons and daughters into harm's way is not acting out of concern for his own business. They must know that we will not enter into a treaty with another nation because the president owns a golf course there. Uh, they must know that we will not change our trade policy because a foreign government patronizes the president's hotels or resorts, and that the president will not favor one state over another with millions of dollars of federal money because one state has given his business a tax break. Never in our history has a president maintained a domestic and international business empire where his personal interests are tangled up with the policy interests of our country or where those personal interests could affect decisions about every aspect of American life from national security to public health, from protection of consumers to protection of natural resources. It's unprecedented that the American people must question day after day whether decisions are made and actions are taken to benefit the United States or to benefit Donald Trump. <coughs> The framers of the Constitution understood these dangers, and that's why they wrote the emoluments clauses. That's why they made clear that the president cannot accept a foreign emolument of any kind whatever. They anticipated the corrosive dangers of even the appearance of compromised government. The president's conflicts of interests threaten our democracy. It's that simple we cannot allow the constant barrage of questionable activities to make us numb. Uh, we cannot treat the president's ongoing violations of the Constitution and his disregard of the rights of the American people as the new and acceptable status quo. Here's a little about what we know so far about what the president has done. He's pitched the Trump International Hotel to foreign diplomats and to government officials. He appears frequently at Trump establishments, using his role as president as a marketing device to raise their public profile. He's paid by companies owned by foreign governments, including China, which lease space at Trump Tower. He continues to take money from foreign governments, including Saudi Arabia, India, Afghanistan, and Qatar, who own property in Trump World Tower and pay him charges associated with those properties. He doubled the fees at Mar-a-Lago after he was elected from $100,000 to $200,000. He hosts foreign leaders there, using the trappings of the presidency to heighten its profile. He even promoted his resort on a State Department website and on embassy websites. He's pursued trademark protection in China for 10 years. He was unsuccessful the entire time. During his campaign and after his election, he indicated he might end the one China policy. But on February 9th, he met with the president of China, pledged to continue the one China policy. Five days later, China gave him trademark protection. He doesn't appear to understand or care about these violations of the Constitution, the Constitution that he swore to uphold and protect. He flouts them. He brags about them. And as we now know from his tweets, he has little respect for the rule of law. And he has little respect for the court's ability to enforce the law. We do not sue the President of the United States casually. I wish President Trump had addressed these issues, these violations, himself but he has not, and they must be addressed and remedied. As Thomas Paine wrote in American Crisis, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must undergo the fatigue of supporting it. 
we're acting to uphold the Constitution and protect what is fundamental to our free and functioning democracy. A president who governs with undivided loyalty to the country and to the people that he serves. As Franklin Roosevelt said, the president's sole thought is the welfare of the United States of America. All Marylanders and all Americans deserve no less. Thank you very much. We're happy to take questions. Tom? Um, well, aren't you just two Democratic attorneys general harassing the President of the United States? Is this partisan? This is not partisan. We happen to be two Democratic attorney generals. I think uh, clearly, uh, Brian and, and my comments, and if you take a look at the complaint, uh, would apply if for whatever reason in the future, Oprah Winfrey or Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg became president, and they wanted to continue their business operation, and they were marketing and benefiting and prospering from their business operations through foreign and domestic emoluments. Well, there, we, we pointed out that uh, he's changed his policy on China, he's changed his policies on Russia, uh, but that's not, that's not, it's, it's not important why. The point is that the appearance and the fact of his taking payments from foreign countries violates the Constitution. It puts democracy at risk when the president is corruptible and the payments that he's received may be corrupting him. They certainly violate the Constitution. Uh, you're quite right uh, that the emoluments clauses themselves have not been tested, certainly by uh, the Supreme Court or federal circuit courts. There are cases pending. Uh, that we're mindful of in that regard. Uh, the case pending uh, in uh, the Southern District of New York uh, is an interesting case that, uh, you know, frankly, we're uh, supportive of. And we think that our case uh, will also further develop uh, the record uh, and the law for the court, uh, which obviously will ultimately be the final arbiter, a necessary cog in the check and balance wheel. I do want to make a point. Uh, it was your question. I don't know your name. Ms. Brennan, uh, you suggested that why are we dissatisfied with the moves the President has taken thus far? Well, you know, and, and the, the American public knows, that the President sometimes says things he doesn't mean. And the President, in regards to separating from his businesses, has said a lot. For example, he indicated that he would not receive any briefings on his uh, businesses uh, from his sons. Well, that was quickly changed, that his sons are now acknowledging that they're giving regular briefings to the president. The a question about your hotels. The Trump Hotel is located not far from here in the District of Columbia. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not aware of any Trump properties or businesses in the state of Maryland. You're the Attorney General here in D.C. If you believe that a crime has been committed here, why not pursue a criminal case rather than filing a lawsuit? Well, uh, I'm certainly not asserting uh, that a criminal uh, case is appropriate. Uh, what we're saying is that the Constitution is being violated, and we believe the appropriate means to stop it is through enjoy an enjoyment action in the courts. Now, look, of course, the District of Columbia, just like the Federal District Court in Maryland, have jurisdiction. Um, we've thought long and hard about it, and uh, I believe that uh, you know, Brian won the arm wrestling contest on this one. I'd like to read you. Attorney General Brown, you have talked a lot about proximity and the reasons between these two entities bringing this case. Um, have you talked to uh, Mayor Pugh, since you referenced the Convention Center Hotel, have you talked to Governor Hogan in terms of the economic um, impact you think you believe the President's actions have had on our state? We, we believe the President's actions have an impact on our state. And uh, part of our part of the point of our lawsuit is is to present that, to prevent that. But the most important point is to prevent the president from putting his interests 
over our interests, over your interests, over the interests of Marylanders and all Americans. Right. But do you, but do you have any evidence? Do you, but do you have any evidence, though, of an actual situation in which there's been a cancellation of a hotel in D.C. or in Maryland that was subsidized by taxpayers, in which the president has profited off of that? And the second part was also on tax returns. Are you guys seeking the president's past tax returns, and what standing do you have to get those? Well, uh, we will be seeking the president's financial information, including his, his tax returns. Uh, it's information that every other president has provided to the people of the United States. And that, uh, in answer to the question a few moments ago about uh, why we're, we're bringing this, President Trump is unique in American history in violating the Emoluments Clause. There is no other president whose domestic and foreign investments and entanglements have been so bound up with our policy and our interests. And he is the only president who has refused to disclose the extent of his holdings and interests. So yes, it will be a subject of our, of our lawsuit. We will be seeking that information. Is there been a cancellation, though? Bruce, Bruce Has there been a cancellation, though? Attorney General Racine, can you talk about what happens next procedurally, and can you uh, discuss the issue of standing as this goes forward? Sure. Uh, procedurally, as you know, we filed our uh, complaint today. Uh, my legal eagles tell me that the president has 60 days uh, to uh, respond uh, to uh, our, our complaint. He can respond uh, with an answer, or he can respond, uh, as he did in the Southern District of New York, with a motion to dismiss. Uh, of course, during the interim time frame, it could very well be the case that the District of Columbia and Maryland seek discovery. Um, and we'll see how the process goes from there. With respect to standing, uh, the fact is that these are substantial legal questions, the questions that will ultimately uh, come before court uh, and the court will decide. Uh, what's unique about the suit that Maryland and the District of Columbia have joined together and filed is that we're pursuing standing on the basis of our unique sovereign status and our obligation as attorney generals, therefore, to protect the interests of our residents. And we know every day that residents of the District of Columbia, and as Brian said so well, residents around the country know that there is a fundamental problem when you have the possibility that a foreign nation is coming in to the United States and maybe doing business with Trump businesses in far-flung places. We don't know the extent of Mr. Trump's businesses. That's part of the problem. And the remedy is to get a court, to take a look at the Emoluments Clause, evaluate our standing, we think we're strong on standing, and make the decision as to whether the president has a legal obligation to do that which other presidents have done on a moral basis, which is separate themselves from their business. Attorney General, what makes you have a unique... What can you do about it? Like, if the president just says, I don't care about this at all, doesn't do anything, what can you do to stop him? He's going to have to answer in court, and if he doesn't do that, he, he will. The Justice Department will, will defend the case. And the, the point is, you know, the emoluments clauses are a firewall against presidential corruption. And the one thing we know about President Trump is he understands the value of walls. This is one he can't climb over, and it's one he can't dig underneath. Can you explain what you mean by unique sovereign status? This is a repudiation of Trump's lawyer. He specifically said that he has taken these actions and that he's going, and that's enough of a firewall against Trump's business. Well, you know, to be honest, I made an allusion to this early. I think that uh, Trump's lawyers on ethics have said a lot. And what we've seen are, time and time again, what they've suggested are the protective measures that the president has taken have not been taken. And what are we to do? Sit back and allow the president to police himself? This is America. We have a constitution. Our founding fathers were concerned about corruption. They were concerned about a president of the United States not focusing on the people's business, but being worried about personal business. What we're doing is exactly what n is necessary in this circumstance, and we look forward uh, to the litigation in court. Please. Remedy that you're seeking, what the contours of a court injunction would look like that would satisfy you at the end of the day? 
So we, we're asking, number one, for a declaratory judgment from the court that the president has violated the Constitution. Number two, we're asking that the court enjoin him from continuing those violations. How the court fashions that remedy is up to the court, but what, that's the relief that we're asking for. What could that look like short of him not being president? That would give us a Well, you know, I mean, being, being a, the president of the United States is a great privilege. It's, it's not a right. Uh, Mr. Trump knew what the rules were when he filed for his candidacy. Uh, it's up to him at some point to decide whether if the court says you can't both run these businesses with all these foreign entanglements, with all these emoluments, with all these payments, uh, you can't continue to do that uh, and continue to be president, then he'll have to choose. But right now, we don't know whether he's picking himself or whether he's picking us to favor in the many policy decisions that he makes. So what concrete evidence to harm, though, have your citizens endured? What are you going to be showing to the courts as concrete evidence of harm to them at this point? Yeah. We, we don't have to show harm. We believe there's been harm. We don't have to show harm. I mean, the fact that he is taking payments from foreign governments, from states, his, uh, his post office hotel is an emolument. My friend, Congressman Jamie Raskin, refers to it as the Washington emolument. But the, the fact that he's got a lease from the United States government, and when the lease itself says that it can't be held in any part by a, an official of the United States government, uh, that's an emolument. He's granted it to himself. The GSA ruled after he put in his appointee that it wasn't in violation of the lease despite the specific provisions of the lease. That's an emolument. Can you Is explain, there any state? Mr. Rathine, what you mean by unique sovereign status that D.C. and Maryland have? Sure. Uh, the unique sovereign status derives from you know, the common law powers and duties of attorney generals to look out and indeed protect the residents of their states. Those powers are not explicitly defined because we can't predict every type of harm that residents of a particular state are going to confront. But what they do mean is that when residents of a state and a jurisdiction like the District of Columbia are harmed by a constitutional violation, again, let's focus on what we're talking about here. We're concerned that foreign governments are coming to the Trump businesses for the single purpose of currying special favor from the President of the United States so that their interest can get a higher priority than the interest of the American people. If that's not a harm to every American citizen and every resident in the District of Columbia in Maryland, I don't know what is. Did any other states consider joining this lawsuit that may have, they may have Trump properties in them, or can they join it now or later? Other states are welcome to join this lawsuit, and it may be that some are considering it. Uh, I would say, with respect to the question that was asked a few minutes ago, we would welcome Republican attorneys general to this cause. Uh, it affects their citizens, and it affects ours as well. Which, you, which of you initiated this? Who called who? <laughs> uh, Tom, we're on. Yeah, we're on. We're, we're on. We're on our. Somebody had to initiate. Well, I think what happens, to be honest, Tom, it's a fair question, uh, and certainly, um, what happens is somebody initiates a call, hey, what do you think about this? And then you say, well, let me sit down with my team and let's sort out the legal theories. The very questions that we were getting today around standing, strength of the merits, hey, has emoluments ever been defined or tested, are issues that we tackled, uh, our staff, and frankly, we got some excellent outside help from the good people at Crew and some other lawyers, and then we determined jointly that this was a matter that Maryland and, and the District of Columbia, quite uniquely, with the Trump uh, Hotel right in our backyard, uh, should lead. Someone initiated it. <laughs> <laughs> Someone it didn't, it was, it's not a urgent birth. Sure. It was pretty close. <laughs> Have yeah. you heard concerns well, from I... business or civic leaders in your jurisdiction who fear retribution if they don't, I, I don't know, if they don't give the president what he wants? Are they, you know, budget cuts or? I think the reality is that businesses operate uh, for a profit, uh, and they're very well aware 
of competitive threats. They're also quite aware of the power of government. And so have I specifically heard from businesses who are afraid of the competitive um, spirits uh, now in play? The answer is a compelling yes. Um, and frankly, it would be terrific uh, for some of these businesses to stand up and say that they too want to believe in the Constitution and want to join our lawsuit as they have in, in New York in the federal matter. What is the federal General, workers? How have you Mr. heard concern from them that there, you know, um, there's so many federal workers in our state uh, of Maryland? Have you heard from unions or workers or their agencies that they fear there may be retribution job cuts? A absolutely. My phone hasn't stopped ringing since November 8th. Yes, Mr. General, how do you know which foreign payments have already happened? Are you basing that on media reports? Assuming you haven't gotten any discovery yet, how do you know what exactly is going on over there? Mr. Trump talks about it. I mean, we, we read about it, we listen to what is said at congressional hearings, and we listen to what the president said. He's got leases uh, with foreign governments. He's got leases, he's got uh, he, they own apartments in Trump World Tower. They pay him tens of thousands of dollars every month. But specifically on the campaign trail, he bragged about the fact that the Bank of China, uh, 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 International uh, Bank of China, I forget precisely the name of it, but it's a state-owned bank, is his world, its world headquarters or its United States headquarters are in Trump Tower in New York. He bragged about that on the campaign trail. I don't think he's given it to him for free. And uh, uh, there are many sources that have given us information about the payments that he's received. We'll have a lot more once we get discovery. Yes, sir, right here. Sorry, the Justice Department on Friday responded to that tweet in the Southern District of New York for a whole bunch of reasons why the plaintiff there there last standing, including the fact that they failed to allege any non-speculative loss, which I think is why we're so concerned to hear about what Sure, and you know clearly we reviewed uh, Friday's Department of Justice filing, um, and I'll say to you it was quite a remarkable filing. Taken to its logical conclusion, what the Department of Justice wrote in a pleading in federal court is that it is entirely permissible for the President of the United States to receive all the money in the world from foreign countries to his businesses, notwithstanding that he has not formally uh, divested himself from those businesses. That, I think, is the most remarkable aspect of the government's briefing. I would add to that that if the Justice Department is right, the Emoluments Clause has no meaning whatsoever. The President can stand over here with his President of the United States hat, and he's not allowed to take payments. But he takes a step over here and puts on his businessman hat, they can funnel as much money to him as, as they want. you got no Emoluments Clause there. And it's absolutely clear that the framers of the Constitution intended that to protect us from presidential corruption. They, they don't have a particular partisan bent. As you probably know, they have the ethics council, the former ethics council from the George Bush administration and the former ethics council from the Obama administration among their uh, members. And they're superb lawyers, and their view is both nonpartisan and right. Last question. I, I can tell you that I've not been called by a Republican lawmaker on this issue. What is most important, and, and let me back up, but while I may not have been called, I think if you go back and look at comments from a few months ago, you know, it wouldn't surprise you that Senator John McCain has expressed concerns um, about you know, Trump's business and his 
official role as president. It wouldn't surprise you that Senator Lindsey Graham has done the same thing. Um, my hope is that these lawsuits uh, that are being brought will cause the Republicans in Congress, and more importantly, perhaps President Trump himself, to take the very steps that we're asking a court to take. Again, the reason why we're here is because the President of the United States, in a wholly unprecedented fashion, has decided to maintain a sprawling international business empire that accepts money without account from foreign governments. Thank you. Thank you. Norm, would you like to respond to the issue about crew? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Norm Eisen. I'm the chairman of the board of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. We're very pleased to serve as pro bono outside counsel uh, for D.C. and Maryland to work with General Frosch and General Racine in this case. Uh, I will say uh, that it is a bipartisan uh, a legal team uh, in the sense that, uh, as the general stated, uh, my vice chair of crew, Richard Painter, was the George W. Bush era uh, White House ethics czar. I had that honor uh, uh, of serving in that capacity for Barack Obama. And we're very hopeful. We've heard from around the country uh, 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 from people, uh, Democratic, Republican, independent of every political stripe, uh, how important this is. We're hopeful that others will join regardless of party. And I know on behalf of our nonpartisan organization and our nonpartisan legal team, uh, and I want to recognize the contributions of folks like Larry Tribe, and Zephyr Teachout, and many others uh, who uh, have been supportive working with crew. Uh, we're hopeful that people will step up. The Constitution knows no party. And I want to say uh, from the bottom of our hearts, and really myself as a D.C. resident, but as a member of the Maryland Bar, uh, I want to say uh, on behalf of everyone how deeply, deeply appreciative we are of the jurisdictions of D.C. Of Maryland, and Maryland and of these two fantastic leaders, of their wonderful teams we've had the pleasure of working with in both offices. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you all for standing up for our Constitution. It knows no party. No, thank what you. Was crew brought into this? I'm happy to speak, uh, speak to reporters afterwards, but I think that was the last question. Happy to speak afterwards.